Hello, everyone. I'm going to stream vertical today. Don't give me a hard time. I did it on purpose. Um, I'm going to take just a moment here and let folks come in the room. We have been off for a week or two while I was um, taking a break, and I'm back at it. I'm all freshened up and ready to start a new round of board and train dogs. So looking forward to chatting with you guys for a little bit. I have a puppy on place who's working on some impulse control, so you may see me check around the bend um, or share a little feedback with him if he needs some support. But um, otherwise, it's just been a really lovely, low-key day. Hopefully, you saw our um, share of our DOD reunion. If you're new to our page and you haven't been following for a long time, this is our sixth dog we've taken for dogs on deployment, Onyx was. And... It's been about three years of doing this now, and uh, Onyx was with us for 275 days, and then on Wednesday got to have his reunion with his owner, Anthony, and it was really special that DOD sent uh, some news connections out to record it and capture it and share it with the general public so that other people can find out about the program and recognize the value and impact of providing foster services for these dogs whose family members have to be deployed for oftentimes very extended periods of time. So um and clear a little notification here um anyway if you haven't seen it i'll share up uh when i get off today i'll share the um recording that we received from one of the broadcast networks it's pretty cute and really was a special honor for them to allow us to share a little bit about our experience and about our organization. We um, obviously are our own nonprofit, but Dogs on Deployment is a nonprofit organization as well. They've been around since 2011 and anybody can sign up to help you guys. You can do that as just an individual. You can go check out information at Dogs on Deployment uh, website, but you can specify the dates that you're available. You can be a short-term caretaker. You can offer long-term. You can have really particular uh, stipulations for what type of dog you'll take. So for example, you don't have to take um, a certain size or a certain breed if you're uncomfortable with that. Maybe you um, you know, don't have as much experience with dogs and you want to start with something simple. It, you know, A dog doesn't have any behavioral issues. In our case, what's cool is that we're able to fill a gap, a need, I think, um, more than most because we're a professional trainer group. And so we have the skills to be able to say yes to dogs that might be limited on their options to go elsewhere. So we have had, in some cases, you know, really large dogs or multiple dogs from the same home, which would be really difficult. Duke and Denali, if you've been around for a while, you'll remember them. They're two really big dogs. One's a um, Huskita and the other is a German Shepherd. It's very hard for a deployed service member, um, you know, to find a place that can take two super large dogs like that and navigate, you know, eight, nine months of care. In fact, I think in his case, it was almost 11, if I recall correctly, that we had them. So needless to say, uh, we're able to take some of these dogs that might be rejected in other situations of, of care. But if you want to get involved, you can offer to take, you know, a very specific and narrow parameter type of dog or breed of dog or age of dog or behavior. Um, you just put in your information about where you, you know, what your home is like and, you know, what your lifestyle is like. And then um, folks that need foster support go on and create their own profile with their dog or dogs listed. And I think cats too, maybe. Um, so anyway, it's a really, really amazing organization. They serve an incredibly important need, and we are very happy to be a rescue partner with them and to make that a way that we give back because it's completely aligned with our goal to stop the flow of dogs from into shelters and rescues or from unnecessary euthanasia, right? Because so often that's the case. If you are, you know, staring down the barrel of a gun uh, to get out of town and have to relocate for a deployment for six, eight, nine, 18 months, and, you know, you've got, uh, you know, no family or friends locally to where you are or nobody in your circle that can take your pet. What what is left? Right. Is often that they get rehomed, they get surrendered to the shelter. I grew up on Whidbey Island and the north end of the island has a naval base and they would see dogs all the time into Waif Animal Shelter based on a deployment. Just can't take with that, you know, no fault of the dogs just can't take with. So for us, it's really, really important to be involved in something like that, that um, meets that need so that we can stop seeing dogs rehomed and instead give them that temporary solution for people who are doing something so important for us. And then those reunions are really special. So 
anyway, just wanted to chat about that for a minute while I wait. Hey guys, thank you for coming in the room. Feel free to drop a note and let me know uh, that you're here. Lisa, I see your comment now. You're welcome. And thank you. Thank you for thanking us. Uh, we have an amazing team and our ability to do this, uh, my ability to do this is would never be what it is if it wasn't for all the people who surround and support um, the fact that I love this this service and that I really believe in it and that they fill in the gaps and we have each other's back. So when someone needs to go on vacation or somebody needs a break, um, you know, just in general or isn't, you know, maybe gets sick or has, you know, a larger load of training dogs that we have the ability to, to share coverage on these pets um, over those many months time. So like I said, you can get involved in dogs on deployment. You can become a foster and make a difference. It's so simple. It doesn't have to be for six months. It could be for a week or two. Um, but I think once you get a taste for it, you'll probably really, really enjoy it and um, be surprised at how much fun it is to um, be a part of that little process. So Today, it's trainer's pick on our topics. So I have a couple things I want to chat with you guys about during our time together today. So many of you are starting to um, articulate your concern for going back to the office. So many of you. Thanks, April. That's helpful. Um, she dropped the link for you. If you're interested in checking out DOD, you can go um, click through to dogsondeployment.org and get the info there. And then um, April, don't let us forget we should share the new story. I have actually clipped it uh, better. Remind me, ping me later, and I'll post it up to this main page here so that folks can see it if they aren't connected to me on the on personal Facebook. Um, so trainers pick today. Topic number one, <clears throat> excuse me, returning to work. Mary made that suggestion today because there have been a lot of folks that are facing this reality after many, many months, year of COVID and, and working remotely or working from home or not working at all. And we have a lot of separation anxiety cases coming in as training requests and our contact forms through our website. It's one of our specialties here. We receive a lot of referrals for it. Thank you to our training partners around San Diego, North County, San Diego, Orange County, LA, who um, are sending amazing clients to us to try to help them. We are booking out our board and trains August and September. Um, and so it really is a crazy time where we're seeing this massive escalation in need for uh, behavior modification resources and board and train programs to resolve separation anxiety issues or um, socialization deficits. Those are the primary two things that have been a cost of COVID times um, where dogs were not getting out, they were not getting socialized, they were not getting experiences that they more traditionally would have that were really pivotal to development and conditioning. And then also, uh, massive separation anxiety, as I said, or togetherness addiction, as I call it. Um, my favorite topic to deal with in terms of coaching humans, because I believe there's so many connections in how you create it and resolve it that give you insight to the way you move through the world at large, just how you operate on the whole. A lot of these things are interconnected, right? People who have issues with anxiety themselves or who are super soft and struggle with being firm enough as a leader in the relationship with their canines. These are, these are common scenarios where separation anxiety is at the core. You know, somebody who is a perfectionist, somebody who is that sort of type A, like me, that type A kind of control freak person who everything's got to be just so we got to get it right. We want to do it perfectly. Um, that type of individual also very commonly has separation anxiety issues they deal with with their dog because this energy that comes alongside that type of um, personality and um, you know process, the way that you operate, your programming, your patterning, your conditioning, um, it really is a common connected thread. And it, it creates a lot of unnecessary pressure when you have a dog that displays some behavior, stresses you out, you get worried, you become anxious, you start trying to control and fix the situation, you don't wanna fail, you want it to happen perfectly, you wanna get it right. Now you're putting, uh, you're shifting that energy into a place where you're feeding off each other. You and the dog are in a loop, right? Um, and so this is a really, really difficult area of training, dog training for many trainers to operate within. Many of them struggle with how to deal with it because you have to be a human coach in this process. For me, it is one of my favorite things to do. At the same time, the board and train process of separation anxiety dogs is one of our least favorite things to deal with because the heavy lifting in that case is so much heavier. It's a lot more work for us on the training side. 
So I want to speak to this for a minute because, um, you know, moving forward, it's going to be really important that dog owners put in more work before their dogs come into a training program to get a better result on the other side. Because training is not just the dog, it's both of you. The relationship needs an overhaul when we talk about sending the dog away for training. We're not just teaching the dog things, we're teaching the human to view and communicate with the dog differently um, and to shift how they work within, you know, again, the world at large. These are things that affect how you, co you communicate expectations and boundaries, um, how you navigate and arrange your brain under stress or pressure in general, okay? Um, so for those of you that are concerned about returning to work, dealing with separation anxiety, either now or concerned about dealing with it in the coming months as life gets back to new normal, um, this is going to be, you know, like rule number one, my recommendation, if you're not already using a crate with your dog, it's non-negotiable. You have to begin that process. It takes a lot of time sometimes to get a dog into a right frame of mind to feel positive about it. Um, and in some cases you don't have time to sort of dick around with the feel good stuff with the dog. Um, we see this a lot in rescue, for example, if we're moving an animal, you know, out of a shelter and into our organization and they need an intervention in order to become adoptable and have a chance at a great life. We don't have days, weeks, months to counter condition and make the crating experience something that feels all kinds of fantastic and lovely, right? It might be that that dog just needs to be in a kennel to transport them to their new foster and then the need to be in a kennel to keep them from doing stupid shit in their new home, especially if they have issues with their dogs or potty training or anything like that, right? So crating is one of those things where in a perfect world, you started it from the very beginning with your puppy. It's the easiest way to potty train a puppy to use a kennel. Um, and then you're killing two birds with one stone. You're teaching the dog to feel good in a den space. You're teaching them to accept the boundary of not being with you all the time and being able to be calm on command. And you're managing that animal um, from being proactively, you know, proactively managing that animal from practicing bad behaviors, right? When people call me up and they say my seven, eight, nine month old puppy is, you know, chewing on the windowsills or rushing out the door. We've had issues with the dog getting loose. They're harassing the other dogs in the home. They're barking at everything they see out the window. Well, guess what? Your dog has too much freedom. Your dog has not been taught how to operate in those situations and should not have freedom to be in those situations until they are taught that get a crate. So separation anxiety, no, sir, do not. Separation anxiety is going to be, um, you know, absolute rule number one resolution for that begins with kennel training, in my opinion. Number two is as you start to do that kennel training and you get feedback from the dog that they don't appreciate it, you now have an opportunity to start addressing the relationship dynamic and the attitudinal aspect of what's behind those behavior issues. So let's say you get a crate. It needs to be big enough for your dog to walk in, turn around and lay down. No bigger. If you get too large of a crate, puppies might soil in it and move away from their potty. You get too large of a crate for an adult dog. They might get busy or destructive in there. They're going to struggle with getting cozy and calming down as well. This is about building a den. Dogs are den animals. It's natural and instinctual for them to go into a cozy den in the, in the wild. You know, there's a genetic component there that they can default to, that this feels comfy and cozy to me and safe. Um, and yet, if you've given your dog or puppy a lot of freedom and you didn't start with the crate, of course, they're going to prefer to be out. They have contrast now, right? So they're going to absolutely have a sense of preference. I want to be with you. I want to play with friends. I want to go out in the world. I want to do these different things. I don't want to be separated. I don't want to be excluded. And that will often um, garner tantrums. It will maybe barking, whining, the dog trying to eat the crate. There could be all manner of issues. April just dropped for you a link to our crate training video where I talk about corrections. Um, it's an oldie, but it's a foundational video that we have on our YouTube channel. You can check out everything else there if you need some more support. Doesn't matter that this behavior stuff comes up. It doesn't matter that the dog doesn't like or prefer to be in there. You are the human in the equation who understands that your dog needs to have this skill long term in order to navigate the world around them at large that does not cater to their needs and desires all the time, right? So kennel training is messy. Kennel training can be a real pain in the ass. It can be a process that has many highs and lows. Just prepare yourself for that and know that that's normal. And if you didn't do the work immediately, automatically, and early on for your dog, you're going to have it worse, ultimately, starting late. It's just the reality of the situation. 
So own and accept that. It's the same as any other dynamic of process. If we don't, if we don't build a standard of operating where we eat right or we exercise regularly or we work on our mental or emotional health, and suddenly we collide into a dynamic where we're really struggling, we're sick, fat, nearly dead, upset, depressed, anxious, that overhaul that now has to take place of putting the right tools and skills in our routine to create balance and health is going to be a million percent harder. Anytime you're making change, it sucks. We have, we have this conversation constantly around here with people. It's like change is really difficult. We generally wouldn't choose it for ourselves. We typically have to do it and we typically face the need for it because something is acting on us from an outside force saying, this isn't working for you the way you've been going. You need to pivot. So expect that journey to be a roller coaster ride. Expect the pushback from the dog. You created it, you built it, you need to own it and you need to move through it. The more resolute you are, this is why I say some types of personalities and people will, puppy, do not eat that leash. You're a dead man. Um, some types of personalities will struggle more with this is because um, their response to the dog falling apart gets them in further trouble, right? Their response to the dog having a tantrum, trying to destroy the crate, whining incessantly, barking, soiling in the crate. If you are a person who responds to that with reactivity, if you are a person who responds to that with panic and anxiety, you're going to feed the narrative for the dog that there's something wrong with this. This is why I single out some of us who have that sort of perfectionist control freak type A um, you know, personality and, or temperament or disposition or habit of operating where you know, we don't have patience, we're not calm, we're not neutral to the fact that difficulty is part of life, right? That stress is something we've conditioned ourselves to manage and recover from. This is a scenario that I see a lot in the dynamic of an owner with a dog. That is why board and train works best because we can remove the dog from that where you're in a bad cycle with one another, teach the dog how to feel differently around this activity, teach them the skills they need to reunite and be more successful and teach the owner how to deploy the tools, the communication, the strategies that work as well in order to create that success. So um, for those of you that joined late, I have, a, I have a puppy on place, so I'm just kind of coaching him. That's why I have to keep checking around the corner. Um, it's a multitask hour, all right? But thanks for coming in. I see we've got some folks rolling in, just no comments coming through. So if you're commenting, apologies from me that I'm not seeing it. It might be that nobody is, just letting you know. So anyway, let's get back to the crate. Um, hopefully I gave you kind of my 2021 uh, two cents about how to anticipate the frustration, the difficulty, the challenge, hey Jessica, that may come with this process if you didn't start it from the beginning. And even if you did, some puppies are just real difficult mofos. They're super committed to their cause. They are personality and temperament prone to separation anxiety. They are really stubborn. They're really willful. They're very, um, you know, uh, they've got a lot of energy. They've got a lot of commitment to pushing back on this process. You just have to recognize, um, you know, that everything that you do control here and here, how you respond is up to you to take responsibility for, and that it will influence how much you struggle in this process or how much you, you get through to the other side. And Often, I know I've said this in one of the past videos that are on our YouTube channel, it's a brutal year of raising and building, but when you get to the other side of it, in most cases, you're looking at 10 to 15 years of being able to enjoy the work there. But it is a time uh, within that you know, building stage that can be really difficult. So get your head in the right place about it. That's got to be rule number one. The crate is something that's non-negotiable. Your dog may have to be hospitalized, transported. If they're neutered or spayed, they need to be on crate rest. If you have behavioral issues, temperament issues, if they have socialization issues because you got a rescue dog and it has baggage or you got that dog last year and you didn't socialize it, whatever the deal is, that dog is going to need a constant. It's going to need something that it can return to in your house, out of your house, in someone else's house, doesn't matter. 
that they know and feel comfortable in, that is routine and steady and reliable for them. That is what the crate does for you. It's a management tool and it's a gift that we give our dogs to be able to access a calm state of mind no matter what's going on. Because there will be days where you will not be able to exercise your dog enough. There will be days where you will not be able to fulfill their mental needs and, and the challenge that they're craving for learning and being busy and active. There will be days where you are not feeling well if you get sick, if you are hospitalized, if you have to travel to take care of some family issue in another state, things that people are not thinking about when they get their puppy and their puppy feels cozy and good sleeping on their chest and will be quiet when you bring it to bed in the, in the night after whining in the kennel. Think about these things I am telling you. Hear my voice in that moment and recognize you need to put that freaking puppy back in the box and you need to fight through that selfish feeling that you would like to sleep better tonight or you would like to hold the puppy because it's so precious and sweet. You must die on this hill, guys. You must. Crating is absolutely essential. So as I mentioned earlier, it's going to also be a requirement for us pre-board and train, period, because we shouldn't have to do this heavy lifting for you. If you are having to be on a wait list anyway, to get in and access our program two, three, four months out. So get that crate going. It's going to be a standard expectation that the dog has exposure and starts that process. And it may be sloppy and it may be imperfect, but you got to get it going. So check out the video that she said April shared with you. It's in the comments. It's on our YouTube channel. I talk about using food to condition. I also talk about corrections and just dogs in the box and what you might need to do to share corrections if they're not you know, settling and making good choices in that dynamic. Um, and if you can go slow and positive and counter condition and really take your time, great. But for many of you, that's just not an option. You need to just jump in there, dive in the deep end, rip the bandaid off, whatever you wanna call it, and get the job done and work through maybe a bad weekend where your puppy, your dog is not super happy, but they get the gist that you're not giving in. You're not caving. You're not going to um, you know, negotiate about this particular new tool and, and dynamic together. So crating is rule number one for anybody who's dealing with separation anxiety now or is concerned about their dog struggling when they go back to work, begin the process now. If you have six months to get ready, which I know, you know, people are facing January, February, we're back to work. You have zero excuse not to start that process and make it a really fantastic association for your dog when you have to be back and away from them for eight, 10, 12 hours in a day. Uh, Arlene, great question. If you answered this already, how long is too long for your dog to be in a crate during the day? Only too long uh, if we're talking about puppies. Puppies that are not potty trained, it's really unfair to crate that puppy for 8, 10, 12 hours if they are not able to hold their bladder or bowels. So in the context of a puppy that is, you know, two, three, four, five months old and doesn't have the bladder or bowel control, you're probably looking at four to six hours on average within those months that you get a puppy. When I get a puppy... I immediately um, start them on a routine where they're out every two to three hours to potty, but they don't hang out with me. They go out, they go potty, they go back in the box. They're in the box more than they're out of the box, literally. In a 24-hour period, they're more in it than they are out of it um, by a long, like a landslide. They probably are out of the crate maybe two total hours of that whole entire day. So it's a pretty significant ratio that most people, I think, get wrong because puppies are cute. They're fun. You want to hang out with them. You want to play with them. You think they need to get all this energy and stimulation. But for anybody who's ever had a kid, you'll know that sleep begets sleep. That when you start out with more emphasis on the skill the puppy wasn't born with, which is an off switch, and you build towards that, and you don't create spoilage and addiction, and a dog that's constantly entertained, um, a puppy that, you know, starts practicing bad habits and bad behaviors and um, getting into a toxic dynamic with you where you're always having to chase around and correct and you're in reactivity to their choices. It's so much easier, right? So yes, puppies should be in the crate a whole hell of a lot. The time out should be quality over quantity and it should be supervised completely supervised. If you're not supervising, put your baby in a box. 
So it's a potty training issue, in my opinion, as far as the answer to that question, Arlene, with, with longevity. Once your dog is potty trained, you may have to work harder at prioritizing time before or after work to give quality exercise, but it's totally okay to crate your dog for eight or 10 hours if you need to. I would rather have a dog in a crate, comfortable and safe, while you are not able to supervise, than have them free in your home, potentially ingesting something dangerous, escaping, if your home is, I mean, I have so many stories. I have so many stories. Do you need to hear the stories, right? Whether it's a dog accidentally knocking over a television because they went trying to get their ball from behind the furniture that the TV sat on and the TV landed on them and they're injured or dead. Uh, a house getting robbed and the dog's loose and the dog gets killed, literally killed or loose. Dogs running out of the house when the house is burglarized and the door is left open. Um, dogs that have eaten, ingested, destroyed, jumped out of a second story window, broken their leg, um, turned the stove on like Luna, as Jessica said, they can literally burn your house down. Um, it's really super dangerous. People don't realize when they're operating from a human emotional standpoint of thinking that's too long, they're going to be you know, sad or bored or uncomfortable or what else do people do? What do you people do? I don't ever have this feelings. So... <laughs> I hear about the conflict internally, but I don't actually have the feelings. So tell me your feelings. Uh, fill in the gaps for empathy sake here as to what the conflict is with the crate. Because it doesn't make sense to me. The crate is a no fucking brainer. I'm a clean person. I like a, I like a clean house. I don't want the hair everywhere. I don't want my dog, you know, going to the bathroom somewhere they shouldn't. I don't want, I mean, I know so many people whose dogs have gotten sick. In the middle of the day, you're at work and your dog barfs or they have diarrhea. Do you want that all over the house or do you want that in the crate that you can drag outside and hose out? <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's just so much easier. It's so much easier. But when you're having a, a mental component of behavioral stuff like anxiety, the dog has anxiety, they need containment. They need to know this, these four walls are all you have to worry about, right? So, Arlie, this makes you feel so much better. I thought it was bad because we work. No, friend, I am giving you your permission slip. Here you go. Permission slip. You can crate your dog while you're at work the whole day. It's okay. In fact, it's safer. It's safer. Now, if your dog is a good dog, if your dog is potty trained, they don't eat their bed, you know, they're chill, you've done the work, you've made them comfortable, Get a bigger crate. That's okay. You can get a bigger crate now. If you want them to be able to move around a little bit more and have a little bit more room, the goal here is still containment. It's still confinement. It's still to say, hey, in this space is all you're responsible for. It's all you need to worry about. And then when you come home, guys, there's this beautiful thing that happens where you come home and you don't immediately reunite with your dog because that, again, fuels separation anxiety. If you come home and it's, oh my God, I missed you so much and I kept to get you out of there as fast as possible and I'm, <gasps> I have all this stress and panic and I rushed home. I didn't even get gas. I didn't pee. I haven't got the groceries. I didn't even call somebody back because I had to get you out of there because you've been in there all day long and I feel terrible. Big mistake. Don't do that. Stop doing that. Do not immediately let your dog out of the crate when you come home. I don't care if it's been 14 hours because a crisis happened. And that's when you arrived home. Take the few minutes at least to slow your roll, take a deep breath, go to the bathroom, get a glass of wine, whatever. Then go get your dog out and do not let them rush out. Do a threshold activity. This is also on our YouTube. Then bring them out to go to the bathroom, get their yayas out, have some quality time with you, take them for a walk. Okay? So don't, don't let anyone guilt trip you into the fact that this is cruel. I can tell you more stories about why the dogs are crated when I'm gone. It is 100% more safe and responsible. 100%. They, you don't, if they get into food, you don't know when they ate last. If suddenly they're sick or they're acting strange and you have to take them to a vet, they need to know when they ate last before they can put them under for anesthesia. 
You don't know if they have a blockage because they've maybe gotten into something and chewed something up while you were gone. And this is thousands of dollars and painful, uncomfortable, no fun surgery. I mean, the, the, the possibilities are endless, but if your dog's in a crate, what's really going to happen? They're going to sleep. I've got two snoring dogs right here. They're going to sleep. They might chew on something safe that you left them with. You know, maybe they can have a Durachew or a Kong that was stuffed with food or that you freeze in the freezer. You can give them things like that to do, but they're going to be in the box when you leave. They're going to be in the box when you get home. There's no guessing. There's no guessing. So number one, get that crate going. Okay. Thanks for emphasizing. Follow this advice. And my energetic, confident, determined four month old pup has learned that his crate is a place he can relax and diffuse his energy. He knows it. And I do too. Susan. Yes. I 10. Yes. So awesome. Four months old, guys. Four months old. Because you just, that's your norm. You just bring them home. You put them in the box. You die on that hill. Maybe you have a bad couple nights, okay? Maybe you have a bad couple nights a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later, whatever, because you start releasing the grip and sharing too much affection, giving them too much freedom, and then they punk you out again and try to get away with stuff. It's normal. But I did the same thing. Nine-week-old puppy, brought her home, put her in the crate. She woke me up one time, peed that night, put her back away. She went right back to sleep. She slept overnight, all night, ever since then. She's never had a problem. Never. In fact, I think it was maybe a month later, just a little puppy, three and a half months old. She got sick. She had eaten something. She got sick. And she woke me up every single hour over the course of an entire night because she had to go outside, have diarrhea, come in, go back in the crate. She told me every single time. It was pretty epic, pretty impressive. Um... She's only had a pee issue in the crate very, very recently. She's seven months old. And I think it's just she had too long of a stay. I was goofing around on a Friday afternoon. Um, and I, I asked her to hold it too long. She just, it's just plain and simple. It was like, oh, okay. Too long of a day today after whatever you horked down, you know, drinking and playing before I left. And no problem. Clean it up. Move on. Right? So I love the crate. I require the crate. The crate is not optional. If you want to work with us, the crate will be part of your life before and after training, and you will thank me for it. It may suck right now. I have some clients who really have to struggle through it. Winston's really giving a hard time to his owner right now. I would say really have to struggle through it, but it really is not, um, it's, it's a no brainer. It's not, it's not negotiable. So that's a big deal for you guys that are concerned about going back to work. And is your dog going to be okay? Is your puppy going to be okay? You need to start planning now. Don't wait till the last minute. Don't test and see if things are okay with your dog being left in the house. Give them the gift of that tool. Then you can start testing out, leaving them out on the weekends for a few hours at a time when you're not around. Rather than having a cold turkey, we now have to start using a crate and you have no, the dog has no context, concept of what this means or, or what to do about this. And then again, some puppies are great. They can hold it sooner and longer. Other puppies need a lot more frequent outings. Small dogs versus large dogs, this can be very different. Certain breeds can have an easier or harder time of it. Male, female can change things a little bit. Um, there's no hard and fast rule here, but there are some glittering generalities that I can provide for you, which is that the more you use the crate, the more you re you know rely on that being the thing that you return the puppy to and you don't spend a ton of time with them out of it, the faster you're going to get through that potty training process. Okay. Um, second subject of preparing to go back to work is you and shifting your schedule and routine to start reflecting what it will be then. So you can figure out how you get your activity or exercise outlets in for you and your dog together. That quality time I talked about, it's not about quantity. It's about quality. And if you're going to have to go to work from eight to six, you know, in a couple months from now. And, you know, you're, you've got a dog that's old enough to hold it great, or you have a puppy maybe that you need to set up for um, getting a dog walker to come in or, you know, a friend or neighbor to give them a bathroom break. You need to start thinking about that. And where will you put in the quality time to drain that brain and give an exercise outlet to the dogs who need it, right? If it's a young dog in particular, this is going to be really important. It's about priorities. It's not negotiable. You need to find the time and rearrange the schedule in order to make that happen. It might mean waking up a little bit earlier. It might mean that, you know, you're thinking ahead now and being proactive about 
the time change? Is it going to be dark in the morning? Do you want to be able to, you know, is it going to be dark at night when you get home? Do you want to be able to do this when you have daylight? Do you have solutions for things you can be doing inside, regardless of the time of day or weather that your dog is, you know, really jams about that fulfills them? Um, it might be some strategic tug work like we talk about sometimes or, you know, other drive outlets, um, detection, scent work, games that you can be playing with your dog of finding their food, you know, making them work harder for it. So you can come home from work and be tired and you can make that meal really count for your dog and not be something that you just serve and it's over like that. And they don't get the quality that they need from the experience of hunting for it and working for it. Start thinking about how you're going to navigate that once you are away from home so many more hours in a day, because you're going to need to build in a solution for that fulfillment, for that drive out. You still have to drain your dog. It's not fair to do a bait and switch like this and go into a new routine, a new schedule, especially for these COVID puppies that everybody got last year that haven't known anything else. It's a huge change and adjustment for them. If you go back to work and to date, they've never had to deal with that level of, um, you know, restricted access to you or limitation on drive fulfillment activities they need to satiate their brain and their development and their energy. Um, this is going to be a really, really pivotal thing to start proactively. Don't wait until the last minute or be in, you know, reaction to the dynamic you're dealing with and trying to find a solution later on. How am I doing on time? Got about 20 minutes. Hopefully this is helpful. Um, if you join late, we're just talking about separation anxiety and specifically in relationship to preparing to go back to the office. A lot of people are facing that. Um, a lot of people are going to be, um, you know, away from home more hours in a day than they have been in this last year or, you know, six to 12 months, six to 12 months. Um, and so it's going to be really important that you have a plan and you have a backup plan for that right now. You know, do you have somebody that can help complement where your days are long and you need, you know, a, your dog to have a break? Um, maybe you can collaborate with some family or friends and you can do some tradesy situations. If your dog can go away and have a play day where you drop them off and they've got, you know, a buddy to hang out with for the day. It doesn't have to be a ton. If you do that once or twice a week, it can be a huge game changer, um, you know, for navigating all of those hours away and feeling, you know, the difficulty emotionally of making that change. But as I said earlier, a lot of behavioral issues are very directly tied to the relationship and the environment the dog is in. So there's massive amount of, of adjusting that needs to happen typically on the human end of the leash in order to not put excess stress, anxiety, pressure, frustration, reactivity, um, control. We all love to think we have control. We have none. Um, it's really important to have awareness for your contribution to those uh, potential behaviors that your dog's displaying where they are, you know, very much connected to the environment or the relationship. And starting that work now is going to be a hell of a lot easier for you, too, because, again, as I said, nobody likes to change. It's not easy. It's difficult. It takes time. Um, and you need to be proactive about it. You need to get on it now. We don't want to be waiting and trying to heal the body that's already sick and nearly dead. We want to do the work to stay healthy and get ahead of those issues and enjoy and feel good in our life because we're making those adjustments on a regular basis towards what is balance, right? Okay. The other thing I wanted to talk about was kind of a quick um, rundown on what to do if you got a dog. So many people added a dog to their life in this last year. What to do if you got a dog and you inherited some behavioral issues where that animal is sketchy towards other people, okay? So this is a really, really, really common situation. Again, that socialization deficit, but also um, a lot of this is genetics. A lot of this is genetics. And so here's a downside to having everybody go gangbusters for rescuing, adopting a dog. I've said my piece about this in the past. You little stink pot, no, do not chew that leash on place, turkey. Um, I've said my piece about this before, but I'll do a quick recap on it, which is that I really don't like the term rescue. Um, I think that true rescue, real rescue, is accepting a match of a dog that needs you and you have the resources to provide what they need. And you make the conscious choice, like, I'm going to rescue this dog because I have what it needs. 
and it's going to be most successful here. It's a very emotionally objective choice. Most people do not make their choice that way, okay? So every now and then I get the pleasure, sorry, gotta adjust. My pants are just too tight, guys. I gotta quit eating. Okay, so most people make the choice to adopt a dog because they think it's cute, the story gets to them, they want a companion to make them feel better, they hate people, um, or they saw the breed somewhere and they think they're awesome and they want one. This is the most common scenarios, okay? So uh, yesterday, somebody texted me, what do you think about Malinois? So-and-so wants to get a Malinois, saw them working in, you know, this person's military, I think, um, wants to get one, wants a trainer. And I'm like, that's the last dog that person needs. If you want a Malinois and you are not a dog trainer or you're not going into competitive sports, move on to your next choice dog. Don't, just don't do it. Don't get one. Um, but it's really common that that happens. They're like, well, my friend had one, or I saw one on TV or in the movies, or I saw one, you know, my coworkers use them for detection or this person I know goes hunting with his dog. It's like, yes, they give the dog a job. They give the dog a job. That's why the dog looks cool. That's why the dog works well. Um, how do I get back on track here, guys? Coming back to rescue. I was talking about why I don't like the term rescue. That's real rescue, in my opinion, is when someone comes to me, they submit an application and they say, I'm willing to wait for the dog that you match me to. And then I call them up and I say, you are single, no pets, no kids. You live in a rural environment. And I have a dog that doesn't do great with other dogs. It's nervous and insecure and a little bit, you know, flighty and sensitive. And it needs somebody who's really patient and, you know, can bond have a really solid relationship with this dog and let it kind of have a bubble and not push it to be something that it's not. And if a person is like, okay, I want to, you know, give that dog the home that it needs. And I have the resources, right? I have this lifestyle and setup that's a good match for that dog. That would be rescue. Most of the time what we're doing is we're adopting secondhand dogs out to families. Families are getting secondhand dogs. That's what I look, how I look at it. So if you got a secondhand dog, you're going to have problems, right? You go buy a secondhand anything. It's got some dents, some dings, some scratches, some snags. Maybe it's discolored. Maybe there's a stain. Maybe there's, you know, it's squeaky. I don't know. Whatever the thing is, it's, it's second. It's secondhand. Dogs are the same way. And so many of these secondhand dogs, genetics are at the core of why they're having issues. The genetics were there already. The environment the relationships, the experiences, and the environment that it's encountered has expressed those genetics, okay? This is true with health stuff as well, but we won't go down that path, so I'll run out of time. So adopting a secondhand dog, number one, you got to accept it's going to have some secondhand problems. It's going to have some secondhand limitations. It's going to have some snags, some rips, some stains. It's going to have some challenges, okay? Often, they're very minor. It's not a big deal. There are amazing secondhand dogs out there. There are absolutely amazing secondhand dogs, okay? They deserve a chance. They make your life better. They can change your life. They have a ton of love to give. They deserve our care and our attention and our support and our resources and our commitment to being better to animals in general as human beings. But some of them, for some of them, the gap, the discrepancy and the genetics and the experiences is just too great. They are not appropriate to be in the community at large. They are not appropriate. They're not safe. They require too much management. There's a liability component there. The dog is more prone to biting. Um, you know, it's, it's hard on that animal to be in a traditional situation of being a pet dog because of whatever their challenges are, that it's just, it's a pressure. It's a discomfort for them to try to navigate and be in this world. I think about feral dogs this way, right? Sometimes feral dogs really, really struggle. We're trying to get them to be a pet dog. We're trying to get them to be successful in a dynamic where it's constant pressure on them to be close quarters in a home with you know people coming and going on a regular basis. They're not socialized, they're afraid, um, you know, these, these types of things, okay? So if you inherited some problems, if you brought a second home dog home, 
And a lot of people did during COVID. A lot of people thought, I'm home now. This is the time I want to adopt the dog. I'm going to have the freedom and the ability to do it. We have a, we're going to get a puppy from the shelter. We're going to raise a puppy from this, you know, rescue organization because we have the time and we're home together. And as a family, we want to have this experience. But unfortunately, um, along with that was not necessarily the resources that customarily exist over prior years, right? To get out and about, take your puppy with you, get your dog, uh, into classes, you know, um, expose them to the things that they would need to be conditioned about, especially at a young age that um, would help them to be more sound and would navigate and counterbalance where those genetic deficiencies might exist. So if you adopted a dog and you're dealing with fear, you're dealing with, you know, sketchiness with people because there was this underlying lack um, or there's this underlying genetic hardwiring Number one thing we find ourselves dealing with a lot is coaching humans on that acceptance piece, coaching humans to understand that training will not change that training can facilitate the opportunity for that animal to build confidence and clarity about how to navigate situations where they feel fearful, avoidant, stressed, insecure, um, but it will not change that this is who the dog is at the core They'll always default under a certain amount of stress or pressure. They'll always default to these deficits. They'll always default to those genetic hardwiring components. So keep in mind, acceptance is number one, really, really important. Okay. This is a fearful, insecure dog. It has socialization deficits. It is a small circle dog. It doesn't like everyone and anyone. Okay. Has a, has a small circle of trust and it needs understanding that that's always on some level going to be what they default to. Training, again, is what gives the dog the opportunity to learn self-control, impulse control, build confidence to face their fears and have stress and recovery experiences that help them become more clear that they aren't going to die because they had to be close to something that they were nervous about or that they're not going to, you know, go through a traumatic experience just because, They don't know what's happening or that person makes them uncomfortable. Really, really important to have that acceptance piece to move towards training to give you a language and a process to help that dog move forward and to stop telling the story. Stop telling the story. If I had a dollar or 10 for every time I had the story coming at me that, well, this is a really sad situation because, you know, they found this dog in a dumpster and it was starving, it was fighting for food, and it had to da da da. That information tells me a little something about, you know, my my approach potentially, I'm still not going to take that into consideration. Ultimately, when I get the dog in front of me, and I start to move forward, and I, I, you know, lots of stories, right? It's like, they got parvo, they were so sick, they almost died. Um, you know, it was a stray, it was brought in on our night drop, we think it was abused, I drop the story, drop the story, you must drop the story, acceptance, and then get to busy doing the work to get a language in place, that's the training, that will help you build connection and clarity, be the guiding force for that dog of how to move through the world and face their fears. And don't hold them to their limitations, hold them to their potential, right? When you have acceptance, you're like, well, this is what we've got. This is where we're at. This is what we're going to default to. This is always going to be a challenge on some level, but I'm never going to stop holding space for this dog to be able to grow. That's all, right? It It's really not dissimilar to, you know, I had this conversation the other day with somebody. If you're if you're adopting a child and they come from a tragic background, they've been abused, they've had a hard time, they don't want to live their life in the shadow of that and always be reminded that those are their limitations. That's not going to do anything for them, right? That You could entitle and enable a child like that, constantly thinking they can't do as much or they're struggling more because they've had these bad experiences, blah, blah, blah. What is most helpful, what is most loving is to say, you can do anything you put your mind to, and we love you and support you to go after that. How can we help you get there? 
So it's not, I expect you to go there. It's not, I'm unaccept. This is unacceptable to me that you have these limitations. It's, I love you. I see your potential. You can go after anything you want to. You're capable of having whatever you set your mind to. How can I support you in doing that, right? So the dogs are the same way. Um, stop holding them to the story. Stop, stop leaning into the limitations or the potential reasons why the dog struggles. It doesn't matter. I've talked about this recently. It doesn't matter why the dog is doing something ultimately. If you care about learning why, you'll only be a better handler and you'll only build a better relationship. I want people to care about that. I want you to be a hobbyist trainer in that sense. But in the most basic sense, all you need to do is disagree, punish behavior you don't want to see and reinforce and encourage behavior you want to see. And do things every day that demonstrate your love through leadership, that demonstrate your advocacy through accountability. All right. So for those of you that brought these dogs home, uh, that we that we do lots of work with, that we love and respect and believe deserve a chance and that we regularly provide training to in order to place and home and see long term success with. If you brought a secondhand dog home over the course of this covid year, that's my my absolute like must do's for you. That acceptance piece, that ownership piece, that you know, training and language in place, that proactivity and, and projecting out for the future. Are you going to have to go back to work? Then you need to follow my separation anxiety advice. If you're going to have a dynamic where life is going to change and your routine and, and situation are not going to be what they were before you were telecommuting and you're going to have to go back into the office, then you need to apply that additional information that I shared with you. But you most certainly should not hang out in this story and continually fall back on, yeah, but this is what happened to them before. So, you know, I was afraid if I put a tool on or if I use the crate or I think there's confinement issue, it doesn't matter. We get dogs all the time that have supposedly had bad experiences with a crate, with a leash, with a collar, with a prong collar, with an e-collar, whatever it is. It's all about how you go about reintroducing and sharing information in those situations of introducing those tools. They are capable of more than you give them credit for. And the worst thing you can do is get stuck in that story and hold your dog back and then still be upset and feeding that energy of frustration and anxiety and stress and control because you're not getting moved forward, right? Hopefully that makes sense. I have such an itchy nose. I think I need an allergy pill. Okay, guys. I think that's it for me today. Is this helpful? Any more questions about these two items, agenda items of resolving separation anxiety, preparing proactively for your dog, if you're going to have to go back into the office, for those of you that are not going to telecommute forever, um, and navigating your adopted dog, your secondhand dog uh, that you may have acquired in the last year. These are conversations we're having all the time with people reaching out for training. No matter what, you need to get a crate going with your dog. If you want us to do work with you, you need to start on that crate. We've put the resources on our YouTube channel. Every information you could need is out there in order to get going on that dynamic, the fit, all of it. Um, you know, our Raising a Rockstar group has tons of information about this for the puppy, the puppy puppy stage. Um, oh, Arlene, great. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. Excellent. How old? How old is the dog coming home? Hey, Christy, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun process, right? It's a fun time, but it also is amazing how quickly as humans we shift into panic mode <laughs> or stress mode when things don't go perfectly and smoothly. Um, we really, we create a lot of the issues our dogs are dealing with. We just do. Don't be hard on yourself, you know, just reach out, get the resources, um, you know, do the work. You'll get, you'll make the change. You'll get there. It doesn't need to be perfect. Just take the next right step. 15 months. Awesome. That's a great age. That's a great age. Looking forward to hearing more updates. That is a great, great age. Awesome, guys. I'm going to get back to work. Puppy finally fell asleep. So success. <laughs> I'll show you. Zoop. Sleeping really good. Oh, he was with Carrie Ann. Awesome. Okay, I didn't realize that. That's great. Carrie Ann's going to be, yeah, it's going to be great for you. Breeder, crate trained four-month-old boxer. Yes, Jessica, that's a good breeder. 
that is a good breeder. Exposure to the crate, I mean, should be early, early, early. They can start putting them individually in crates when they feed before they ever sell them, send them home. Um, and it makes a difference. It really does. It's less shocking for that puppy to leave their pack mates and suddenly be, you know, um, alone in a box trying to figure the world out. But even then, their strategy for helping them navigate that decently, make sure they're tired, you know, put them away tired and give them something warm and cozy to snuggle up to because they miss their litter mates. If you've got a brand, brand new puppy you're bringing home, which I know a couple people right now do, then uh, there's definitely some, some hacks that help with that process in those first few days. But it can be very, very difficult as well. And, you know, um, reality is, though, you, you got to die on that hill. Don't give up. All right, gang. I'll talk to you guys later. Have a wonderful rest of your Friday. Thanks a million for hanging out with me. I appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Bye.